Hi everybody, uh, thank you for joining this webinar about the IMI Pain uh, Care Project. Uh, my name is Mary O'Keefe. I'm the Research Projects Advisor at the European Pain Federation, EFIC. And <clears throat> on behalf of EFIC, I'd just like to say we're delighted to be hosting this webinar and we're delighted to be also an active partner in this uh, excellent and really exciting project. So before we, we, we get on to today's webinar, um, I just want to let you know that there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and I just want to encourage you to ask as many questions as, as you want as they, pop into their, as, as they pop into your mind. You don't have to wait for a, a certain time. And we have three blocks of question and answer time, and that will give you, us a lot of time to have discussion. So without further ado, I will let this over to Deirdre Ryan and Rolf Dedef Trader to introduce the project and the webinar. Rob, yeah, uh, you want to start? <laughs> yes, uh, please go ahead, Deirdre. Well, I'll welcome you all to um, the first of the patient uh, focus sessions for IMI uh, Pain Care Project. I welcome you all. It's always great to get patient engagement in something like this, especially so early when to many it may seem soon or you may not be familiar with IMI Pain Care. So it's great to see you all here today. We all know that we can't talk about patients without patients. And research, of course, focuses on many aspects, both of the patient experience, but all the way through from the lab to the bedside. So what really happens at the, the mechanism level in the body, the psychology, the, all the details, all the way to what are the practical implications of how can we roll this out how will this make a difference in the day-to-day -day lives for patients in your healthcare system? And it's so important that patients have a role from the very beginning, from designing what questions are we asking, what projects are coming up in the future to really address the needs of patients and making sure that they're part of that process, not in the middle being pointed at, discussed about, but part of the discussion. And that means respect, uh, plain language, uh, considering health literacy, digital literacy, and really involving patients in a meaningful way. Many patients have had the experience of being, you know, involved in tick box exercises where to receive funding, a project needs to involve a patient. So they give you a call and say, be involved in our project. And that's where it starts. And that's where it ends often. Thankfully, this is not the case in, in this respect. It's a comprehensive project that we're proud to support, of course, at Pain Alliance Europe. And it really echoes that through the, throughout the research, uh, research cycle, the patients can and should be involved. So while there is the, the individual need of the patient, there's also the greater good and the feeling that goes with that of participating in something that goes towards the bigger view, the world view of improving healthcare and improving research by our participation. Thank you. Look forward to today. Over to you, Rolf. Yeah, I'm Rolf de Trede. I'm a neurophysiologist working at Heidelberg University, and I'm the coordinator of the IMI Pain Care Project. We're very happy to discuss our project outcomes with people living with pain, because this is very important, as Deirdre pointed out. And in fact, patient representatives have accompanied us, us all along, and some of them will actually give some presentations here today. So we appreciate the input that we receive during the planning stage. Um, there are also some future steps uh, that we are interested in taking that were initiated by patient representatives. Um, and I would like to mention also that EFIC as a scientific society is also a member of our project. So the project has a very broad range of stakeholders. And I think before I continue with generic terms, I would uh, like to lead over to the next part, which gives you a project overview that will be presented by Peter Blums Funke, uh, the initial coordinator by the FPR side. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you, Rolf Detlef. Thanks to everybody on the line, and thank you so much for your interest in this project, and in particular, how we strive to uh, engage, uh, or we strive to engage patients in our project, and of course, to achieve meaningful improvements for pain patients uh, in Europe. To my person, I was um, a project lead previously, and now I'm consultant to this project. Let me um, explain you what motivate. Mo no, let's let's uh, keep the slide of the introduction, and uh, I would like to uh, uh, briefly summarize also what motivated us. In fact, seven years ago when we designed this project. And in fact, we had early on discussions with Pain Alliance Europe even before this project was started. And what was really motivating us was that we had to realize that so many patients in Europe suffer from pain. And that is despite the fact that several therapies are available and accessible in Europe. So we call it high unmet medical need. And this was in really important to find out what is uh, helpful to improve the situation. And we started with clinical practice to think about this. And we thought one important point is that it is often not easy in clinical practice to define the situation of the patient as well as to define improvement of pain after start of treatment. And we think this is really a point that needs to be improved to improve the situation in clinical practice. Another point was, as I just said, the current therapies did not satisfy the needs of the patients at that time point. And we said together, we do not want to uh, discover and develop new therapies. Uh, this should be uh, um, left to the industry, let it be pharma industry or biopain, bio uh, biotech companies. We realized that a lot to, needs to be done to improve uh, the rate of uh, development in pain. In fact, what is important is that more than 10 years, we do not have new therapies for pain. In fact, the failure rates for development of new therapies is pretty high. It's higher than for other diseases. And so we sat together and thought, what is necessary to facilitate the discovery and development of new therapies? And we realized that there are a couple of methodologies uh, which need to be improved to make this happen. And one point is clinical development of new therapies. Again, like in clinical practice, we think it was important to find better tools to define and to understand um, the diseases and define the situation of the patients. But also one important point was here that we really had to implement what we know since decades that human beings are individuals. And so this means that we need to find the right drug for the patient, let it be a subgroup of patient or ideally an individual. So that is that we felt here we need really to improve the tools to um, enable this or enhance this. Another point within um, development of new therapies is that we all had to face the fact that the transition of a new therapy from preclinical research and development to the clinical phase uh, is really a valley of death for new therapies. So that's why we thought we really need to work on this particular a phase of the in the life of a new therapy and to improve the methodologies and the techniques that are available or even have to invent, invent new ones together. And finally, we also uh, realized that it is 
so important to improve also drug discovery and drug development. So finding the best methods or pathological methods that are suitable to tackle via new therapies to improve the identification and selection of these mechanisms and also to do the what we call preclinical testing of these therapies. This means preclinical means everything that is be, uh, before clinical testing. Let it be uh, cell cultures or um, animal models of pain. The whole spectrum is understood in, in this term preclinical testing. And here we said we really need better models that better reflect the situation of the patients and allow um, here to um, select the best new therapies at an earlier time point and predict and to better predict the efficacy later on in the patient. And as you can see, this is quite a lot of things that we identified are really important to enhance research and development to identify and develop improved therapies and also to improve the clinical practice. And we had to still said to make an, an a relevant innovation, we need to prioritize. And that's on the next slide. Mary, please show the next slide. So in fact, in our project, I My Pain Care, we prioritized uh, three areas, which we organized in sub-projects, and you will hear more from the sub-project leads. And one is what we call providing standardized patient-reported outcome measures for pain treatment. And these patient-reported outcome measures are, first of all, very important in clinical practice, but also in clinical trials in the development of new therapies. This area of our research is organized in the sub-project, which we call PROMPT, and this is the name you will certainly hear several times during our webinar. Another focus was the area of uh, what I said uh, to accelerate the transition from preclinical to clinical development. And here we had the focus on improving translatability of pharmacodynamic functional biomarkers in pain pathways. And this is quite an abstract title of the subproject biopain, but in essence, it is really to help um, the and uh, reduce the failure rate when advancing a new therapy from the preclinical to the clinical part. And you will hear more about it uh, in a few minutes. Then, and the third area was improving translation in chronic pelvic pain. And this is a lot of understanding the mechanisms also to find um, biomarkers and comorbidities in a certain area of uh, pain diseases, chronic pelvic pain, which is in fact an area of very high unmet medical need. And you will hear again um, more about this sub project, which is called TRIP. So, and as I said, we thought we need to prioritize on these areas. And uh, still, this is quite ambitious that it really required um, a, a very um, a good consortium of multiple stakeholders from multiple sectors. Sectors, in a sense, patients were involved from the beginning and also other sectors. And now I would like Mary, please advance to the next slide. So in fact, we created uh, um, quite a close cooperation between various stakeholders in pain from Europe. Most of us come from Europe, but also two partners came from the US. And uh, the consortium consists uh, of multiple stakeholders from various areas, six uh, pharmaceutical companies were engaged, uh, 23 research, research centers, universities and hospitals six uh, biotech companies, three scientific societies, and EFIC is among this, three patient organizations, 
And I would like to add Pain Alliance Europe is uh, in addition supporting this project. So altogether, we have 41 partners from the various sectors giving the perspectives and also representing various disciplines from basic research, clinical development, clinical practice, and the patient perspective, as you have just heard. It's a five year project, five years project. It started in April and will end uh, this month, but we are sure that we will um, have, will maintain several and for have follow ups on several of our activities. We have partners from 14 countries and uh, together we have a budget of 23 million uh, euros. Um, more than half of it uh, was in-kind contributions from the pharmaceutical companies who do not get any funding. And the funding of the EU goes to the, uh, what we call public partners, that's the research centers, hospitals, biotech, scientific societies, and patient organizations. So, and that is a very, very brief overview of the project. I'm happy to uh, ha help answer questions later, but uh, now I would like to hand over, I think, to Jane, and then later on uh, we hear more about the sub-project. Hello, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, yes, well, we found that patients and their organizations <clears throat> must be involved in project projects such as this right from the start. And um, there were uh, three patient representatives here, uh, one for endometriosis, one for chronic pelvic pain, and me for ICBPS, that's interstitial cystitis, blood pain syndrome. And um, we were involved uh, really before the application papers were even submitted uh, from 2017 uh, we were involved and so we spent a lot of time checking the application papers for the study line by line word by word and bearing in mind these were hundreds of pages it was a very time consuming uh, business and <clears throat> We did quite a lot of different things throughout the projects. We attended meetings. These Some of these were in person, a lot online, monthly meetings online, um, one for clinical, one for preclinical. And we were always invited to comment. And I think we had quite a lot of comments sometime. Um, we were also on the project email lists, so we received all information throughout the project. And um, during the project, there were a lot of publications and we were always invited to comment on any planned publications. And um, we were asked to write pieces often to be included in some of these published texts. We raised a lot of issues, uh, and that was particularly me actually, about terminology and definitions being used. We were asked to give presentations, and we were doing this quite frequently. And I have to say there have been periods when it's been quite intensive and quite time consuming. And a problem here that is that it's difficult if you're running or helping to run a patient organization because a research project can take up quite a lot of your time. So I think that um, patient organizations had to plan this uh, very carefully. Um, <clears throat> would you like to me uh, to go on about uh, the training that's needed, uh, Mary? Of course. Yeah, I think that's very relevant and people would like to hear about it. Yeah. Have you got the slides? Uh... Yes. OK. Um, now, the type of knowledge 
and training needed to participate in a research project may vary depending on the level of the research project concerned and also whether it's a national or international uh, project. But it is essential to have a thorough knowledge of your own disease or the disease you're representing. And this will include uh, diagnostic methods, all treatment methods and all product, products used. Confusable diseases that have to be excluded. Another word for this is differential diagnosis. Um, remembering, however, that this does not exclude patients from having a so-called confusable disease as well as the main disease. Then you have to know about the associated disorders. And in my field, that's quite a list. And these are also known as comorbid diseases or comorbidities, diseases that are known to occur commonly alongside your disorder. Guidelines, these are very important. And you must have a knowledge of all the leading guidelines worldwide and differences between them. And standard terminology and definitions. Now that you think, well, there's one set. No, there isn't one set. There may be 10 different sets, and this is a problem. You need to know about the standardization documents and about any controversies that surround them. And also useful to have an overview of the history behind this, how they were developed. Next slide, please. In addition, a good working knowledge of English is indispensable. You need to have the confidence to speak and to give presentations. You will have to attend relevant conferences. Now, sometimes today, these are virtual, so that doesn't cause so much of a problem. But sometimes you do have to attend in person, and there's a problem here, which is getting funding to attend these conferences. You need to maintain contact with patient advocates and support groups in other countries to know exactly what is going on. Uh, what treatments are being used and what the problems are in other countries. You need to know who are the leading clinicians and researchers in the field. You, ne to, you need to know how to access PubMed to find articles, to find at least the abstracts, and be able to understand scientific articles. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to understand them word for word. Uh, I had no scientific background, and certainly I wouldn't understand all the basic science. But you need to be able to get a grasp of what they're trying to convey. Uh, the clinical articles tend to be uh, easier to follow. Um, be aware of which journals mainly publish in your field so you can keep an eye on these. Know which professional medical and scientific societies cover your disease or your wider field and have some knowledge of how research projects are set up. Particularly important today, is to understand the role of regulatory and other authorities. And uh, examples are the EMA here in Europe and the FDA, etc., but also national authorities who are the people who authorize reimbursement of treatment in your own country. Now, I'm sure there's a lot more, and it very much depends on uh, what disease you're representing. It can be much more complicated than this, but that's about it. That's fantastic, Jane. Uh, thank you very much. So um, I think sorry, we Mary, have some... 
Barry, before we move on, um, I, I had a question for Jane myself, but maybe um, there might be other questions as well from, from patients on the line. Um, Jane, if you don't mind, if I ask a question, um, your your sort of training presentation there was was wonderful, and I'm sure is is quite interesting and and inspiring for people on the line. But it, it also sounds quite um, daunting, almost like the the amount of uh, information and the amount of skills that are required. Now, I, I assume that you 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 didn't start off. Um, knowing all this stuff right away do you think it's possible for people who are i don't know not research experts or patient experts to become um equipped to participate in research projects in the way that you describe yes well absolutely because i'm an example i have no scientific background at all i studied uh, modern languages um but uh what um i did have a special interest in words. I was a professionally a translator and editor. So the meaning of words was very important to me. And I transferred this to my interest in standard terminology. <laughs> but I, I had no knowledge. I didn't even have very much knowledge about uh, interstitial cystitis. But my generation of patient advocates were very lucky. There were a lot of um, NIDDK symposiums on interstitial cystitis about every other year in the U USA. And we used to be able to get funding to go to them. And you not only met everybody, you got to know all the doctors involved, all the other patient advocates involved, but you gradually picked up all the information and they used to give us articles they'd written and uh, say they said read this and uh, I really didn't understand more than 10 words at the beginning in any of these papers but gradually you pick it up and uh, I took an interest myself in the history and I started researching it going back to the early 1800s and uh, I, when I was doing that, uh, I also picked up a lot more and understood it a bit better, how it had got to where we are now. But really, uh, I think very few patient advocates have a medical or scientific background. Uh, there are some. We have the odd doctor who's uh, a patient, but mainly we all have to start from scratch. And it takes some time, but there are for background information there are courses but in my field we're now starting to see how can we train these patient advocates around the world what's the best way to do it it, it is quite difficult but uh, you have to start at somewhere you start at the beginning and build up well, I, I'm going to ask another question, Jane. But if if someone else has a suggestion, they can they can pop up in the chat, and and we'll we'll cut to them shortly. But um, I so for for those that don't know, my name is Sam Kimman, and I'm the executive director of the European Pain Federation. So I I work for the the clinicians and the researchers, but I I often work with patients, and in particular, Pain Alliance Europe, and. Um, it, uh, well, I'm, I'm I'm intrigued by how EFIC and PAE can play a, a larger role in research projects in the future. And uh, maybe you can just help us explain, Jane, how did how did you get involved in IMI pain care initially, and you know how how did you sort of enter this world? Uh, it well, IMI pain care it just popped up on my email. It was February 2017. I had an email from Katie who said, uh, would I like to be involved? And um, I said, yes, <laughs> that was it. <laughs> but I did know a lot of the people and I had, I was for a long time before that, a member of the IASP. And so I knew the work that they were doing. And, um, and that and gave me a lot of background too, because I've been for many years a member of the ISP of the ICS, the International Continent Society. And I learnt a lot of what I know, I learnt from the ICS, actually. 
um, and also a member of the EAU, the European Association of Urology. And um, now you can get patient membership. I was having to pay for it but uh, in those days, but now you can get patient membership, um, sometimes uh, free in some of them. And um, that's how I, I learned quite a lot. And, and so I knew what I was getting into more or less. Yeah, Sam and Jane, maybe I can comment on this. So in these projects, of course, we have people like Jane who already are educated and are leaders in the field. Um, so uh, meetings, international meetings, also often have something like called patient alleys. But of course, there we meet people like Jane who already are representatives uh, of a certain field. Uh, if, if you want to get into this, possibly the public lectures that many conferences offer are one way to get in contact with these organizations. Uh, the issue of travel money, of course, when there is a research project and patient organizations are affiliated, that's a way to, to, to give definitely free registration for conferences, but also sometimes some travel money. But I assume that Dietre has much more specific comments as leader of uh, Pain Alliance Europe, which is uh, an umbrella organization for actually many uh, pain uh, uh, patient organizations. So probably, yeah, Dietre, and you raised your hand, fortunately. Thank, thank, <laughs> thank you, you, Rolf. And thanks for introducing me, which I forgot to do at the beginning. I just assume everybody knows me at this point, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so I, I think Jane raises a great point on how you can upskill as a patient, but also every project has an entry level for every patient. And we don't all have a skill set at the very beginning. And really every project needs all different kinds of patients from someone who just wants to share the lived experience of a disease and is happy to answer a questionnaire or sit down and have a discussion with the researcher in the form of an interview or something like that. And that's really how a lot of patients will engage with research. It may actually be having answering a Twitter poll on, on Twitter. There's, there's lots of different smaller ways, but they produce great results all the same, which are very much participation in the research. Of course, from there, especially when you have the interest, as Jane mentioned, you can really build the skills to help, as I was saying at the beginning, around adding value to every stage of research, where, where you know, understanding the mechanism of research is an asset to be able to give the patient perspective. When you understand the, the dynamic of the industry and how research works, you can add more value while also being able to give that lived experience. You can also add the skills of saying, you know, here is where patients need to be involved. Is it at this stage? Maybe it's at later stage, really in the design of things. And that does take a little bit more education, but that doesn't undermine the value of what lived experience is and being able to, to, to do that and having the, the confidence, but also the right um, environment to be able to do that. And that's so important, that creation of, a, of an environment. And I think that this project is a great example of that, that there's great accommodations made to involve people in that way, that things can be discussed in plain language. It doesn't matter what level, you may be more, let's say the expert patient or you may just want to share your story and there needs to be accommodations for that as we go along. So I think, um, Jane, you gave a really great example of how we can all level up, um, but we have to remember that research is open to everybody. Yeah, I entirely agree. Great, thanks. I'm just aware we also have Judy Birch on the line. Yeah. Uh, Judy, would you like to, have you any comments or would you like to add anything else to that? Um, yeah, I think uh, had I seen that list of Jane's um, in 2016, I would never have got, become involved in the project. <laughs> um, yeah, because I'm I'm not a scientist, and I actually think that um, our contribution should not be from a medical or a scientific background. And um, I'm also a linguist, and. Um, my interest really came from being able to attend pain meetings and 
becoming familiar with the areas of research and thinking, well, why isn't any of this happening in pelvic pain? And, um, you know, I'd followed what was happening in pelvic pain and gynecology, in neurology, psychology, physio, pain medicine. And I thought, well, these people really aren't speaking to each other. And as a multidisciplinary organization, we wanted to encourage a multidisciplinary approach um, in research and clinical practice and felt that progress had been hampered by a lack of collaboration in research and clinical expertise and that that wasn't benefiting patients. So, um, yeah, and there was a lot of work on back pain, arthritis and diabetic neuropathy, post diabetic neuralgia <laughs> and pelvic pain wasn't in there. So, um, and but I had conversations with a lot of the people who um, were, you know, leading on a lot of these other areas. And I asked them about pelvic pain, endometriosis, all the other conditions. And they always sort of scratched their heads a little bit and, uh, <laughs> and realized, I think, you know, that, uh, that it was an area that was neglected and, um, you know, hadn't really been addressed in any uh, thorough way. So it was wonderful to see the experts from the, the disciplines that, uh, that I'd come to know working closely together and broadening their knowledge and increasing their understanding of patient needs. Um, so I'm really optimistic that this project will lead to more effective therapies and approaches and to a more targeted individual approach to those with individual pet, with pet, pelvic pain, whatever condition they've got. Um, and very proud to have contributed to the project. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it is time consuming, but I think there are important things that we've raised along the way that ha have been taken on board actually. And um, that's been really heartening. And I would love to see, um, and there's a lot of spin-off work now coming from this to do with patient reported outcomes uh, with the NIH and the EMA work. So, um, yeah, I'm just really thrilled that that was able to come together as a project with all of those disciplines represented, people working collaboratively with the input of you know, us as patients as well. So yeah, amazing. <laughs> thanks, Judy, that's great. And um, thanks everyone for all those perspectives. Um, we're just gonna move on to the next section now and there's more time for questions later. So I can ask the speakers later. So I'm just going to share my slides again. Yes, so. So now we're on to subgroup uh, one, uh, functional biomarkers for pain. And this is me again, Rolf Dietlef Trede. So I'm uh, coordinator of the overall project, but also leading uh, the subproject Biopain. Uh, most of the work is actually done by Ambretta Caspani and Tony Blockiel, who are appropriately acknowledged here and uh, also available for questions. If you could advance one slide. Thank you. So at face value, uh, these functional biomarkers that we're looking in are for monitoring the effect of a drug treatment. However, as it turns out, some of these biomarkers are also useful for diagnostics. So they may actually be encountered by people with lived experience along the trajectories uh, of their suffering and hopefully also relief. Um, as you will notice, we follow this, um, this this aim that Peter Blums Funke had mentioned to do a translational research. So do, we do a fully parallelized work in both rodents and in humans. And therefore, this raises the issue, what's the role of animal experiments? And thanks to our patient representatives uh, that you just heard uh, and discussions of pelvic pain, we were also involved in, in discussions of stigma associated with psychological concepts around chronic pain. So uh, some of, of you may have uh, encountered uh, problems with medical people assuming it's all in your brain, you're making this up. And as it turns out, we did all our studies in perfectly healthy subjects, but nonetheless, we can apply the same concepts and we see that 
within the range of healthiness, there's a broad range of these psychological concepts of susceptibility, which however also govern uh, the pain sensitivity of people in everyday life. So these are the three topics and some of the slides might be a bit challenging, but if you keep those topics in mind, I hope you'll we'll be able to draw something useful out of that. Uh, yeah, please next slide. Um, it's about the concept of biomarkers, uh, which is about a biological response to some type of a treatment. And in this small insert, you can see that we looked at the effects of three particular drugs. They are model drugs uh, with certain presumed mechanisms of action, and they are relevant uh, to pain. So on one hand, the aim was to refine the animal models so that they reflect more of what's happening in people. And on the other hand, they serve the purpose of proving that the target for the, the drug, where the drug was supposed to bind and have its effect, is actually reached in people. And you can see some complicated pharmacology in the middle of the slide. And if you move on to the next slide, the figure on the left hand shows up again. We have different levels of the nervous system that we can address. We can address peripheral nerve. We can address the spinal cord and we can address several regions in the brain. And we need several different approaches to look at these so-called compartments in the nervous system. And as you see in the left hand slide, we know that for example, local anesthetics, when at least when they're applied locally, they act on peripheral nerves, some other drugs act on the spinal cords, others act on the brain. But in most existing drugs, as you can see from the arrows on the right hand side, these colorful arrows, most drugs act on more than one compartment. And this is one of the aims to, to pull apart which uh, drug is acting well. So I pulled one example, next slide, uh, that was uh, also presented by, by Tony and Ombretta before. And uh, a lot of this work was done at University of Bristol and uh, in Rome at Sapienza. You can see on the left-hand side, depth recording inside the spinal cord of a phenomenon that had been called the cord dorsum potential in preclinical literature. It went all the way into the literature of spinal cord monitoring in neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery. But as you can see on the right hand side, it's actually possible to do a recording by placing one electrode on the throat, another electrode on the neck, and then giving about a thousand or so electrical pulses to a peripheral nerve. And then you can see this nice little potential called N13. And these are basically examples of target signals that we're recording in humans, like you see on the right hand side. But for some aspects, we obviously need animal experience experiments. The next slide uh, summarizes some of the, the results that we found. So we found that uh, the signal that was certain reasons had been neglected in the clinical literature because it thought to be part of the pain pathways, whereas um, the technique used here is usually uh, implied to study tactile pathways. So it has been existing, but somewhat neglected. And in our project, Katrino Leone and, and her colleagues were able to show that it really affects the excitability of the spinal cord in people. And as you can see on the left, uh, when we increase the excitability by sensitization, capsaicin, so if you handle hot chili peppers and you have an injury on your hands, you notice, oh, it causes a burning sensation. And then the, the pain goes up. This is the, the red symbols on the left-hand side. And this signal also goes up, but with a certain treatment by pregabalin, this increase can be prevented. We can also look at the reverse, there are certain paradigms that try to activate brainstem pathways that reduce pain. It's called condition pain modulation. And as you can see on the right-hand side, uh, in the left panel, these red dots are shifted upwards. That's a threshold for pressure pain. So people become less sensitive when the threshold goes up. And on the other hand, you can see that the signal goes down. So it's again showing uh, the spinal excitability. In this case, under brainstem control. And we have discussed this also at clinical neurophysiology meetings, and there's some discussion to reconsider the diagnostic value of this signal in the context of looking at pain pathways. Next slide, please. Um, 
So when we use biomarkers that exist in both animals and, and humans, we can, of course, use it uh, for translational purposes to bridge this gap between the preclinical development of drugs, for example, and the clinical side. Now, as I emphasized, we're doing pretty much the same thing in animals and humans. However, in humans, you can explain, I'm taping an electrode to your neck and you will receive a certain number of stimuli. You cannot explain that to an animal. So very often animals have to be anesthetized just because of the reason uh, that you cannot explain to them what you're going to do, although the burden is really very mild. On the other hand, as you can probably appreciate when we need to find out where exactly in the spinal cord the signal is generated and also what the drug levels at that specific site are, these things are too invasive to be done in humans and uh, then animal studies actually are needed. However, we absolutely subscribe to the three R principles and this is one of the purposes of uh, this project also to do the refinement. Next slide. This is about trying to destigmatize, not so much directly the chronic pain condition because we're not studying patients, but stigma that has been brought up uh, by our patient representatives in the context of looking at psychological concepts around um, pelvic pain in this case. So in our healthy subjects, we also use two patient reported outcome measures. One is a pain sensitivity scale. This just asks about imagined everyday situations, how painful you think they would be. There's a certain variance between healthy people. Some think if someone steps on their toes, it's mildly painful. Others think it's strongly painful. And the interesting thing is that this difference among healthy people is partly predicted by what's called the pain catastrophizing scale. It consists of three aspects. Rumination means that people consider to think about what this could mean. Magnification uh, would reflect uh, that people expect things to get worse rather than be optimistic uh, to expect that things get better. And helplessness reflects uh, also self-efficacy, whether you're sure you can handle things and be in control or whether you feel like you're a victim of everyday situations. And even among healthy people, these scores predict self-reported pain sensitivity. And I think that's very important also to communicate to the outside world that a score on the pain catastrophizing scale is nothing pathological. There's a huge overlap between our healthy subjects and uh, patients uh, in the pelvic pain group. And therefore, we hope that this part of our work can also help to destigmatize chronic pain. The last slide is uh, the acknowledgement of the support that we have received. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Rolf. So um, just going to check here, does anybody have any specific questions at this point? I have a question. So mm -hmm. at a basic level, what is a biomarker? So if, if a patient is in a clinic and, and they meet their clinician, is there any way there and then of knowing what biomarker is being targeted or if it's being changed? Yeah. So I think we will get back to this when we get to the subproject prompt. So patient reported outcome measures are in a way the gold standard when it's in pain medicine, because pain by definition is subjective. And whenever someone says I'm in pain, that's the ground truth. However, uh, for certain, some situations, we like to have something that is measurable by devices. It does not replace the pain report by a patient, but it could support certain aspects. And in our case, for example, when it's about medications that are intended to alleviate the pain and they don't, uh, there are several uh, possibilities. One could be that just there's not enough of the medication at uh, the site where it's supposed to act. And there might be some lack of evidence of target engagement, as we call it. Or it may be that the pharmacological target is engaged, but the pain doesn't get better because it has a different mechanism. So this is not directly these examples and, and the drugs that we're looking at. That's not the current clinical use, but this is one of the aspects where 
uh, therapy could be monitored. And maybe even better, um, if you think about cancer therapy, where lots of biomarkers are studied beforehand to then guide the selection of which treatment is appropriate for which patient. That's uh, an aim also in pain medicine, but we're very far away from it. But for this uh, selection of subpopulations of, of people, biomarkers can be helpful and diagnostic use, as I pointed out. Um, I have another question, and it's relation to the difference between pain and sensitivity or sensitization. So that mm -hmm. word was mentioned a lot. What 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 does it mean on a on a patient level if someone says you're sensitized? What what does that actually mean? Yeah. So an important distinction is pain versus nociception. Nociception is the signaling. Uh, starting with certain sense organs and continuing through peripheral nerve, spinal cord, and different brain structures. So this is something that can be studied, and where the sensitivity can be changed, can be decreased, and can be increased. The clinical pain is only loosely related to the signal processing. Uh, one of my favorite examples is when you go to the dentist, uh, sometimes the dentist has to cause a lot of damage, but it doesn't hurt because the nerve signals are blocked in the peripheral nerve by a local anesthetic. So clearly there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between the damage and, and what people are feeling. Now, um, so in that sense, the nociception and sensitivity to external stimuli sounds a little bit academic because it's something that you can study in the laboratory. But uh, some of these sensitizations can contribute to the clinical situation. And uh, I think the best studied example is inflammatory pain. Inflammatory pain actually in many cases is a heat and acid hypersensitivity. We know this because uh, there's a transduction molecule, chip one that can be activated by heat and by uh, uh, protons. However, it's usually not very sensitive. So normally you need pretty strong stimuli, strong acids to activate this. However, in inflammatory conditions, this molecule becomes so sensitive that the, the body temperature that we have is a stimulus that is above threshold. And you, you probably all experience that if you have had an injury and you cool the injured tissue, then the pain goes away. This way you lower the temperature again so that it's below the threshold. And a similar situation exists for uh, the pH. And inflammation, inflammation becomes a little bit more acidic. Uh, that itself would not be sufficient to activate this receptor. But when it's sensitized by inflammatory mediators, then also the, the tissue acidosis can become a super threshold stimulus. This is important in post-operative pain. We might get back to this later. And likewise, there are uh, situations where mechanically, uh, where mechanical hypersensitivity plays a role. Uh, so that's probably serving to protect um, our injured sites from accidental future damage by mild mechanical stimuli. I have um, one more question before we moved on. You refer to the destigmatization of chronic pain and how some of mm -hmm. this work will help that. How much of an issue is stigmatization, do you think, in this area? Does it vary by pain condition, chronic pain condition, or is it... Um, a universal, is it a universal problem? Maybe the, the patient representatives might have a, a view on that as well. Yeah, we can add, please add to this. I think, uh, unfortunately, it plays a huge role. Um, in my experience, headaches and particularly migraine headaches have had quite a success in overcoming that stigma uh, in the past two decades or so that it took them to overcome that stigma. And uh, patient advocates played a major role uh, by showing to them they're not lazy people that want to evade work, uh, but they really have a problem. They're working on the problem, educating other people. Some people have it at a low level, so it doesn't need specific treatment, but uh, so a mild pain can probably be handled by oneself. So it is a big problem. It differs tremendously across conditions. So if someone is a cancer patient and suffers from pain, that's considered legitimate. I think Jane may speak to it that particularly in the different types of pelvic pain where we have lots of different organs that can be 
involved. It's also part of the body that is not considered very highly in at least our Western societies. Uh, it does play a role. But with this, I would like to hand over to, to the patients themselves. Maybe Jane. Do, and... do you want to speak, Jane, <laughs> or do you? Yeah, or do you yeah well, I, I represent uh, the bladder, which is in itself a stigma. And anything you have wrong with the bladder is stigmatized. Nobody wants to hear about it. Um, you can't talk to your friends or your family about it. They just don't want to know. Um, and um, but we also had to face up in the last, especially the last two decades, to uh, statements that pain in the bladder was purely psychological or everybody had been traumatized. In, indeed, it got to one point where it was put about that every IC patient, every woman had been raped. This was extremely embarrassing. I can tell you when I had to give a presentation, I found everybody looking at me and thinking, hmm, she must have been raped, you know. What sort of trauma has she had? None of which was true at all. And um, it, so, We've been working very hard the past two decades to try and overcome this attitude because, believe me, it spreads like wildfire when you're talking about a disease that is not fully understood. Um, and certainly it's at least in part a rare disease. Um, there's not enough money for research, the research that's needed. And when something's unknown, you start to get a burst of theories, ideologies, uh, wishful thinkings, and uh, it's, it's a huge stigma. Um, we still haven't got over this. There are still plenty of uh, clinicians who are quite convinced it's entirely psychological and uh, it's, it's a very difficult situation. And uh, I'll keep on going while I can to try and overcome this. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, it has been quite a struggle to um, to improve the, the, this. But I often think about, you know, breast cancer and the situation many years ago. You know, that was yeah. also, you know, not really talked about very much. And um, and I do think things have improved. I mean, I actually, I was listening to the news here last night in Austria and um, Jessica Ennis Hill was talking about the fact that her training program, um, she always had greater difficulty in her uh, sports life during her period. And there's been an app developed which can, um, you know, help athletes with their training, looking at the follicular follicular phase and all of these difficulties and she was talking about her period you know openly on um, yeah. international tv and I thought well I think that I think we've made a bit of progress <laughs> so <laughs> and um you know just being at these meetings and meeting you know with people working in the field I think it makes it much more real for them and uh, I think that they are much more appreciative of these kind of issues. A French doctor once said to me that um, they don't, we don't like to talk about anything below the belt. <laughs> but actually, I mean, they're, they're much more open than in many other countries. In France, I think it's quite different. So yeah, but yeah, it, it's a battle, but I think we're, we're making some progress on that front. Yeah. Mary, are you able to, to watch uh, the, the raised hands in the participants? There are two raised hands yes. from the participants. Okay, good. Yes, uh, so Katie, Vincent. And also, also from the participants. It's a, it's a separate list, at least on my screen. Yeah, Katie, oh, of course, raised your hand too. Yeah. Sorry, I, I couldn't see them when I was sharing the slides. Yep. That's what I was afraid because it's sometimes so. There are also participant questions. Perfect, thanks. So I guess I just wanted to add in to this, not um, saying that there isn't stigma against all chronic pain patients, but I think unfortunately <clears throat> we still stigmatize women more than men. 
yeah. and there's very good evidence for that that the approach to a female participant a female patient is different from the approach to a male patient you're more likely to treat with analgesia for a man rather than think about psychological approaches for a woman for example which probably has um, negative effects on both if we think that you should have a, a multidisciplinary approach to pain in general but I think when we then think about these personal intimate areas of the body and being a woman the pelvic pain conditions have been hugely neglected and hugely stigmatized in the past. Yes, I agree. It's very much the Freudian hysteria concept. Um, all women are hysterical and, and yeah. their pain isn't real. Yeah, it's very unfortunate, isn't it, really? But yeah, we, we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep going on it, Jane. <laughs> That's right, yes. And it's very, very interesting in the field of urology, where we're based with our bladder pain, um, because we've seen in the last two decades the emphasis moving more and more to simply dealing with men's problems. And um, I once asked uh, years ago, um, why is there so much attention on men and uh, they said uh, and not on uh, I see they said oh well I see isn't fatal I said well look at all this stuff about erectile dysfunction is that fatal no no but that's a question of the quality of life of the men and that's so important I said what about the quality of life of women um and they looked you know, astonished that I should even think of anything like that. And mm. I'm afraid it's still around. Mm. I don't and know I what we can do to change that. I really it's don't. interesting, the difference between men and women that contact us. I mean, the men are far more, um, I would say, use the word catastrophizing here, than, than the really? women. Me. and um <laughs> yes <laughs> it's quite quite obvious um you know the the, the tone of the, of their emails and um you know the help that they're seeking and support mm, yeah. interesting yeah i absolutely agree so we've some hands raised from three of our attendees so uh massa contact do you want to unmute yourself and and give your comment or question please That doesn't seem to work. Would you like to write it into the question and answer function? And we also have questions from Lydia, Maria and uh, Katie or, or Kathy. Sorry if I'm saying that wrong. I'm not sure if the if your mics work. Can anyone hear anything? So maybe only something? maybe only the chat works. So Katya Antonopolo also mentioned in the chat that she raised mm -hmm. her hand. Um, but if the microphones are all disabled. Yeah, maybe you can add the comments uh, for us to discuss as well. I can see there's another hand up again. If you want to put the comments in the chat and, and we can we can discuss them here yeah. as well. And I, I will say while we're waiting yeah. for those comments to come through that back in 2019, PAE did yeah. a survey on stigma and pain. And, and we did also overwhelming response of over 6,000 um, participants who really wanted to give their feedback on this topic specifically. And we have to remember that this is a societal thing as much as it is about in healthcare as well. And mm -hmm. the attitude towards people, for example, with low back pain, you know, as a malingerers who just don't want to work, all of these terrible attitudes that exist in society um, before we even reach the healthcare setting. And the impact of that is that patients are waiting over a year before they go and seek help because in society we know these attitudes exist. So when we surveyed patients how long they waited before they, they went to get help, they waited over a year because they were afraid of the response of what they were going to meet when they went to get to healthcare. And that was irrespective of the type of pain. So when we look at the stigmatized response that, that um, different patients received, it came at different degrees throughout the healthcare system. 
the lowest rate of stigma that they felt was from nurses and it just went up from their GP they found there was a serious lack of education on pain and that really was a stopgap because they really opened the door towards the specialist care and when you you reach a sort of wall at that level it really limits access to care and you're less likely to want to push forward and the huge effort that it takes to push forward and seek further help so the the stigma is it's so complicated in terms of the societal as we're hearing the attitudes we have all towards gender how we all appear when we're in pain for example how would you, what should pain look like do i look like i'm in pain at the moment and then uh, how those attitudes that we form around that and then also then how how we are met by healthcare and how well different healthcare representatives are trained in pain especially in chronic pain when you have somebody coming back time and time again this didn't work this didn't work my pain is still there what can I do I don't think you're understanding that I don't feel hurt and where do you go with that when you're living in pain you may not have the energy to be able to continue so it takes a huge effort and that's really why we need patients involved in these things to help inform that process that all those voices are are being listened to and I think at the moment we have some we have the comments coming through I can see Mary I'll hand back to you yeah, so I just uh, had a follow up question on that uh, for everybody, really. Do you think there is hope maybe of conducting some mass media campaigns or doing some more work in the in the media about raising awareness of, of, of this issue? Because we see it being done for other conditions, but it hasn't really been done for pain. I, I guess funding might be an issue, but has anybody thought about that? The simple answer is yes, do so. We had some activities in Germany a while ago. Pathways out of pain was a topic that we wanted to call it. It worked very nicely for migraine. Uh, Mary, there are some questions in the what a Q&A part now. Yes, um, so there's a question from Christine. Can I ask about the stigma associated with nociplastic pain conditions such as fibromyalgia? Is there any being, work being done to change this? Yeah, I think it's one of the conditions that has the strongest stigma and the invention of the term nosoplastic pain is an attempt to counteract that by looking or by trying to identify a mechanistic explanation. Um, I think we still have a long way to go. So in my lab, in a different study, we actually tested this grading system uh, that Eva Kusek and others have proposed. And it works nicely in complex regional pain syndrome, but it didn't work so well in fibromyalgia. And my personal explanation is, the reason is that the current definition of fibromyalgia no longer includes the tender points, which actually, whatever they are, it's difficult to understand, but are a sign of a hypersensitivity, a sensitization that is postulated in this nosoplastic pain context. So paper is submitted. We don't know whether it will be accepted, but uh, there, there are attempts to work on it, uh, but so far not uh, successful. Okay, so there's a comment here. So there is now a very good campaign about the differences between women and men in the UK entitled See My Pain. So thank you for that. I'll check that website out. And then there's another common pain gap index report. Um, I presume that's referring to a, a, a publication in the area. Yeah. So the hand had been raised also by Angelica Valente of IHI office, but I don't know whether she can connect... She has lowered her hand again. Uh, Hello, can you? Ah, hear me? you can. Yes, now yes. we can hear you. Yes. 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 Uh, <laughs> yeah. You you send the um, you send actually the button to unmute myself. Uh, actually, I have a comment. Uh, I would like to ask you for this very interesting event for uh, have invited me and a presentation uh, done by Jane. I have indeed a comment to that when she talks about uh, training. Uh, to make patient become a patient expert using training. Uh, I wanted to, to just raise this comment that uh, it is really important to prepare the relevant materials, read the out and all the documentation that would help a patient to understand more the scientific world in order to provide the, the right comment based on their experience. And also to have uh, to choose the right people to speak to these training events. 
are two elements I consider uh, particularly important to achieve this goal. And uh, also, I would like to say that uh, we don't know yet the right date when uh, this will be launched, but IHI is uh, launching uh, a call for expression of interest uh, to create the IHI patient tool and um, adding uh, patient mm -hmm. in, engaged more at uh, project management level. So I'm talking about uh, involved uh, in eventual topic text development uh, to choosing a specific topic for a call or even for the proposal evaluation or the project review. So in case you are interested in, uh, in participating, in be part, becoming a member of the HI patient pool, uh, the, the future one, <laughs> uh, once the call will be, will be launched, please stay tuned because it will be announced on our website. Thank you. I think the mics are now working. So, Massa Kontik, so do you now want to, to comment? I think I think you can now speak. Or Lydia Maria, you also have your hand raised. You can now speak, I think. Perhaps I can't unmute. Or maybe the hands are raised by mistake. That sometimes happens. Um. I wanted to say that now the, the organizer allowed me to unmute myself. There is a button that appears uh, um on the bottom left of the screen yes for people maybe they, they didn't notice it because before it was not there but now it is there available yes. to, yeah. to be unmuted it seems like massa kontish has unmuted herself now yes please go ahead Are you there, Masa? No. Okay, we'll move on and we'll try Lydia Maria one more time and then we'll, we'll move on to the next section. No, okay, we can move on, but but hopefully, if they still want to question, want to ask a question, they can ask uh, later. Mm -hmm. Okay, share the slides again. Sorry, Mary, I'm just checking, but um, you can see the questions that have been asked typed out, right? Yes, I can see the comments now. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we're on to subgroup two, translational research in pelvic pain. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to present this on behalf of the whole TRIP consortium, um, which is co-led by Jens Nagel from Bayer, who unfortunately can't be here today. And as you've heard, involves the three patient participants um, very closely in the whole um, generation of this project. Next slide, please. So um, the real patient-oriented aims of TRIP were to think and take a much more pain-focused approach to some standard chronic pelvic pain conditions, particularly endometriosis and interstitial cystitis, interstitial cystitis bladder pain syndrome, to try to better understand chronic pelvic pain from a pain angle, and then to think about new ways to subgroup women with chronic pelvic pain and then to translate this back to um, the preclinical work and think about how can we improve the animal models of endometriosis and interstitial cystitis bladder pain syndrome to try to improve the work that develops from preclinical models. Next slide, please. So just as a bit of an introduction for people who aren't so familiar with these conditions, 
Endometriosis is a condition that's incredibly common. About one in 10 women will be found to have it. We know that it's a pathology in the pelvis, so it's the presence of tissue that resembles the lining tissue of the womb, but outside of the womb. Commonly, we see this tissue on the lining tissue of the pelvis, on the ovaries, sometimes on the bladder and the bowel. But we know that the amount of pain you experience from this condition isn't related to the amount of disease you have or where in your pelvis that disease is. And we don't have any way of diagnosing it without doing a, 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 an invasive test, so a, a laparoscopy, a keyhole procedure. And our current treatments target these lesions specifically, so they um, burn them or cut them out surgically, or they suppress them with hormones. And obviously these treatments have lots of unpleasant effects, side effects, um, complications, and often they don't work. And so we find that many women are left with pain um, after they've had repeated surgeries or using lots of um, unpleasant hormone treatments. And one of the key features we know of endometriosis is that it's very commonly associated with other conditions. And there's lots of work being done to try to understand why that might be. And some of those are other pelvic pain conditions, such as bladder pain syndrome or IBS. But there is also a strong overlap with things like migraine and then um, inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis. So there, there are more complex relationships there. Bladder pain syndrome is less common than endometriosis, but on the other hand, it's probably very underreported um, and is still um, relatively common within the population and causes a significant impact, particularly on quality of life, as Jane has already mentioned. We know that um, people with bladder pain syndrome have pain, but they also have bladder predominant symptoms as well, so the urinary symptoms too. And again, we know that if you look in the bladder and look for inflammation or lesions within the bladder, this doesn't relate to the symptoms that the patients might experience. And again, we don't have a diagnostic test either to rule in or rule out bladder pain syndrome without putting a camera in and having a look inside the bladder. And again, our treatments target the bladder, so surgery or drugs put into the bladder and then bladder re-education and physiotherapy. And again, these treatments are frequently ineffective. And we see again that patients with bladder pain syndrome often have um, other pathologies. So there's a lot of similarity between endometriosis and bladder pain syndrome, though obviously they're, they're different conditions. Endometriosis only occurs in women and bladder pain syndrome is more common in women than in men. So our hypothesis for the sort of overall aim of TRIP was that actually both of these conditions could actually be considered as chronic pain conditions that are very similar in the ways in which pain is generated and maintained, but they obviously are associated with specific features that are, are unique to those conditions. Uh, next slide, please. So we went um, about exploring this in two separate ways. We had um, a package of work um, looking very much at the clinical situation, so looking at, at women with pelvic pain. And then we had um, preclinical work looking at animal models, which I'll move on to um, later. So our clinical work involved trying to really, really deeply characterize um, a big group of women. And we had in our um, first phase of our study, we had about 800 women divided into those with chronic pelvic pain and um, pain-free control women. And in the chronic pelvic pain group, we had four separate groups. So those with endometriosis and pelvic pain, those with interstitial cystitis bladder pain syndrome with no endometriosis, those with both conditions, so endometriosis and bladder pain syndrome, and then a final group of pelvic pain patients who have neither bladder symptoms nor um, endometriosis. And initially we explored this um, with a large batch of questionnaires. Um, and then in a smaller group, we've also done some more detailed testing. So you can see here some examples of thinking about how you might respond to pinprick or vibration and other um, tests to sort of understand the situation more broadly, such as, for example, drinking a very large glass of water and thinking about how much pain you're in until you need to empty your bladder. Next slide, please. And so, what might this mean for patients? Obviously, there's lots of data within here that we think is of real academic interest. But um, as a clinician myself, I'd really like to try to move um, our findings forwards to have benefit to patients directly. 
And I think the first thing is that if we can identify dysfunction in pain systems, then it may be that we can think about trying treatments that are known to be effective in other types of chronic pain. And you can see here, for example, a slide just showing that actually in patients with pelvic pain compared to the controls, there were some differences in the way that some of these um, sensation tests were perceived. So maybe that means that there's more alignment with some of the other chronic pain conditions than we might have thought of previously. And I'd also hope that we can identify new ways of subgrouping people to try to decide who might best respond um, to a certain treatment on the basis of what might be underlying their pain, rather than on whether we find a certain pathology when we do surgery. And again, you can see here from this figure that we divided those responses to all the different um, stimuli that we used into specific groups that had been defined from some other work, and can see that there seem to be different subcategories that cross over all the different patient groups. So potentially giving us a new way to subdivide patient groups. Next slide, please. And how have we taken this back into the animal world? Well, we know that there are lots of models of endometriosis and of interstitial cystitis and bladder pain syndrome, but that they really try to focus on the diseases themselves, recreating endometriosis, for example, in the, the pelvis of a, a mouse. And we actually don't know how well that really relates to the human condition. So what we've explored is in the literature and then in the animal models that um, already exist in the groups that work um, in our consortium, we've looked to see how well actually do these models recreate what we know about the human condition. And having taken some of the work that we've done in our clinical package back to look at some of those features too. And then we can think about how could we refine those animal models to make them more reflective of the human condition. And we've also been thinking about other ways to try to assess the effects of treatments, because we've already spoken today about the fact that pain is, is really wide ranging. And so it's not just about response to a poke or a, a warm stimulus, for example, it's about how do animals interact with one another, or how do they feel about exploring new experiences, for example. And so we have this um, novel cage here that you can see a picture of that means that the animals can be monitored 24 hours a day, and we can see what activities they're doing at night as opposed to during the day, for example. And we hope that this might give us some more meaningful outcomes that would allow us to really um, test new treatments and see if they might be beneficial in the human situation. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. That was really interesting. Just going to check the Q&A. I think we have questions, have we? Anybody else seeing new questions on their screen, just to make sure it's not an issue with my, my, my screen? It says the chat is disabled, Mary. Someone has commented. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, but there's a second chat line called Q&A. So probably that, hopefully that's open. This is where this comment came in. Yeah, sorry, there's, there's a difference between the specific Q&A function and the chat. So you're not using the chat for for questions to the panel. You're using Q&A. Yeah, but the chat is also able to work now as well. But yeah, uh, we're working via the Q&A. So I might start us off, uh, Katie, with some questions. I, you were saying during the start of your presentation that there isn't always a good relationship between the level of lesions or disease or tissue damage and pain. So why might that be the case? Because you would think on imaging, the more disease you'd have, the more pain you'd have, and then it would make sense if you get something like surgery, that it would work. Um, can you explain a bit about, uh, about that? I think that's a really good question. And I think in um, th this isn't unique to pelvic pain conditions in, in any way. Um, in acute pain, it's much more likely that if you have um, tissue damage, you'll experience a certain amount of pain. We know that if you break your arm, it's going to hurt and it will heal gradually. And hopefully that will reduce over time. 
But once your pain's been there for a long time, there are so many different mechanisms that start to play into it, that that relationship between whatever is happening at, at the outside bit of your body and the amount of pain that you experience becomes um, quite unrelated. So whether that's your nervous system sort of turning the volume up on pain, altering the way that it's processed, whether there are other factors that come in, like changes in how your muscles function or changes in your psychology, that kind of thing. We just know that there, there are a lot of different things that are happening in between between the, that outside stimulus and what you perceive um, as pain at the end. That's becoming increasingly understood by, by the, the public or, or, or patients, or, or do you think that's still a, a real stumbling block um, to pain treatments that I guess might some people be more open to certain treatments if they think they work in a certain mechanistic way, but from what you're saying, it's a lot more complex than, than it seems. I think when patients have got as far as chronic pain clinics, that information is delivered. And I, I know that lots of hospitals provide um, you know, pain education classes, pain management programs, that kind of thing. Um, I think at a sort of broader community level, that information probably still isn't out there. And I think that probably contributes to some of the stigma. You know, you only have mild endometriosis. How come you're in so much pain? My sister had stage four disease and she was able to go to work and have a couple of babies. What are you complaining about? You know, that kind of information still isn't um, as widely understood as it should be. And do you think if the if the information got out there about biomarkers or if we were able to find, if we were very confident that biomarkers were linked to particular conditions, do you think that would be a key moment in people maybe having a better understanding or is it more complex than that? I think in the field of pelvic pain, at least, biomarkers are more complicated because I think there's two separate things. There's a biomarker to make a diagnosis of the disease or there's a biomarker about how much pain is being generated or by what mechanism that pain is being generated so it, it would be really lovely in the future to be able to say this set of biomarkers will say you do have endometriosis you don't have endometriosis this set of biomarkers will say that your pain is inflammatory and then we know that we can treat you with this type of medication or this set of biomarkers will say that your pain is related to your nervous system so we know that we can use these set of treatments but at the moment, I think we're a really long way away from that. And I think we need to be careful about confusing the story with biomarkers about diagnosis when this project at least is thinking about biomarkers with respect to pain. You spoke about three different profiles in one of your in, in one study that there was three different um, sensory profiles across different patients. Would you be able to explain uh, those a bit and what they what they might mean? Yeah, so I was just really using that as an example to say that, you know, we have four different patient groups within our pelvic pain population, but there are some things that we're finding that actually we see in different subgroups, but that they don't relate to one of those types of patient group. So that might be a different way of if we had 100 patients dividing them into separate groups that might explain their mechanisms rather than explain the underlying disease, for example. Okay, we have a question in the chat. So have you found that any factors may predispose a person to develop chronic pain from an acute pain condition such as post-operative pain? So that's not really the aim of TRIP in that we all the patients that we looked at already had chronic pain or all the controls didn't have chronic pain. So I might, if that's all right, leave that question for later after um, Winfred's done his presentation, because that's very much the aim of PROMPT. Great. So, Christine, we'll come back to that question later on. Great. So does anybody else have any questions before I move on? I can see there's two hands raised, but they've been raised from previously. So, so I think they're just up from previously. Perfect. Uh, great. Thanks very much, Katie. That was fantastic. Well, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Winfried Meisner, and together with Hiltrud Liedkens, um, I am, or we are the leads of uh, the PROMPT subproject. And Claudia Weinmann is our research coordinator here in Jena, and she 
also joins the session. And I will now very, very briefly give you an overview about our project um, and the different sub projects. The next slide, please. Yeah, that's the title. Um, providing standardized patient reported outcome measures for improving pain treatment. And we have altogether three work packages. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. What is the background? What was the what was the, what is the justification for setting having set up this uh, sub project? Um, everybody knows that um, pain assessment is one of the prerequisites for treating pain clinically and also for doing clinical studies um, on uh, drugs and on, uh, other interventions. Um, however, um, there's a very long debate on, um, on one side, um, is it more or less possible to use subjective pain measures, in other words, patient reported outcomes, um, to, um, yeah, to measure pain, uh, to, uh, um, to uh, inform treatment, uh, treatment decisions, and also to separate um, treatments which work uh, and treatments uh, which do not really work. Um, and uh, furthermore, um, there are several dimensions of pain. Um, you might be aware of the differentiation between the sensory um, aspect of pain and the affective um, aspect of pain. And so there are a large number of tools developed, tools, normally questionnaires, questions, uh, which try to, um, yeah, to, to assess these different dimensions of pain and different populations. And the situation uh, becomes even more difficult as there seem to be also cultural differences between different countries, um, cultures, uh, languages and issue, which makes the comparability between um, yeah, pain outcomes, patient reported outcomes between different countries even more difficult. Um, and this uh, is also true for clinical trials when a company wants to um, yeah, do research uh, for a new painkiller or another intervention. Um, it's uh, not always easy to um, identify the best measures which work not only in one setting for specific type of um, pain disease or culture or country, but which might or hopefully work also in other settings. Uh, however, this, exactly this is required for the process um, of improvement for a new drug. So this is the background of this sub-project and the basic idea or the basic objective is or, uh, to yeah, to um, find some time, something uh, like a consensus or alignment on those outcomes, outcome measures, uh, both in acute and positive pain, which are the best to measure, to assess pain, both clinically and in clinical uh, trials, um, which, uh, and which should be um, used as something what we call core outcome set. So, core outcome set is a minimal set of measures which should be used in almost all clinical trials and also clinically in more or less all settings um, worldwide. So this is the background of uh, this project. And the next slide, please. Yeah, so the um, different work packages um, are aiming for different, um, um, yeah, time, uh, let's say or situations where pain is an issue. The work package two is dealing with acute post-surgical pain and aims to um, align on those patient reported outcome measures, which are um, sh it should be used in uh, acute pain setting. Work package three um, is looking on patient reported outcomes, which might um, predict the chronification of acute post-surgical pain. And work package four is um, searching for patient reported outcomes in specific situations of, of chronic pain, specifically in neuropathic pain and in 
pelvic pain. And I can only show you a very um, small part of, um, of our um, uh, studies and also only um, indicate some outcomes because we are still in the phase of analyzing the data. Next slide, please. So um, this is an uh, example from Work Package 2, um, how Work Package 2 um, try, tries to, um, yeah, to align on a core outcome set for acute post-surgical pain. Um, in this um, Work Package 2, um, there were three different approaches um, which were used. One was an extensive literature review, uh, which was done by this work package. And I should uh, mention Esther Bogatsky Zahn and Hiltrud um, again for being the leads of this work package too. Uh, and um, the group um, then um, used the uh, results of this literature review for a large Delphi process. So Delphi process is a um, type of consensus finding where different stakeholders, representatives from different groups like surgeons, anesthesiologists, nurses, psychologists, also um, a large um, uh, represent a group of patient representatives and um, other stakeholders um, in a quite formal process consent uh, on, um, yeah, on such a core outcome set. And the third part of this project um, was a very large prospective observational trial where we followed up um, more than 3,000 patients, 3,300 patients after four different surgeries. Um, this was hip surgery, um, sternotomy, breast surgery, and endometriosis surgery. Uh, not only for a few days after surgery, but up to six months after surgeries, where we approach these patients, ask them to fill out questionnaires, and the idea was to find the best outcome measures, the best questions or questionnaires, um, yeah, which in the future should be used for clinical trials and for uh, clinical routine. A small sub-project was um, also, I think it's very interesting, was also done in this large uh, observational trial. We um, gave about 200 or 300 patients um, a so-called activity tracker. You see this device here on the right-hand side. It's a little bit like a Fitbit. You know these uh, devices from... Uh, yeah, the sport or from in the, many smartphones all already have these devices. They count physical activity. And the additional idea of the sub project was to compare objective physical activity data and also sleep data with these patient reported outcomes. Yeah, um, one um, preliminary outcome of this um, activity was in the first. Um, large Delphi round, consensus round, um, all stakeholders consented on what we call domains. This is the over, let's say, it's the, the group of measures which should be used. One domain is pain intensity, for example. One um, uh, domain is um, physical function. One domain is side effects. And the fourth domain was self-efficacy. So these are the fourth domains which were identified in the first uh, consensus conference. And just in these days, we are about to finish the second Delphi conference, consensus conference, where we will consent on the measures which should be used for each of these fourth domains. Next slide, please. Yeah. And um, similar yeah, in the other two uh, work packages, I only can very briefly um, uh, report what um, has been done here. The idea is to uh, identify patient reported outcomes and perhaps other um, yeah, demographic or clinical data, which might could be used to, um, to, yeah, to calculate something like a risk score for the risk to develop post-surgical pain, I already can say now, it will become very difficult. There will not be a very simple risk score. This is something I already can tell you now. And in the four, in the work package four, as I already say, uh, said, um, this group is um, consenting on patient reported outcomes, specifically in your pelvic pain, pelvic pain, chronic pelvic pain, um, which mainly 
could and should be used for the prediction or the one idea is to identify prompts which might predict which drug or which intervention will work better in the specific um, pain condition of this individual patient. And also here, I cannot um, report on the outcomes already now because the group is in the final stage of analyzing uh, its data. Next slide, please. Yeah, and this I think is my last slide. So what is the potential impact for patients? Um, I think um, there are at least two main um, impacts or main achievements. One is that the um, worldwide use of um, consented outcome measures hopefully improve pain treatment in daily routine because they hopefully will be used frequently in every situation where acute or chronic pain is an issue. And uh, if they are used um, in a standardized way, then institutions can compare their quality, can identify deficits and approve their pain treatment. And on the other side, um, such a core outcome set hopefully improves the development uh, of new drugs because um, uh, the potential um, yeah, effectiveness hopefully can be identified earlier than um, it is now the case. Yeah, that's in a nutshell the content of subproject prompt. Thank you very much. Thanks, Winfried. That was really interesting. Uh, I noticed we have Claudia as well on the line. Would Claudia like to, to add anything before we get on to some questions? Uh, no, right now, I think Winfried has explained everything. If there are any questions, especially uh, about this uh, observational non-interventional trial, I'll be, of course, uh, ready to answer them. Great. Um, maybe we'll start with the question that was already in the chat from Christine. So have you found that any factors may predispose a person to develop chronic pain from an acute pain condition, such as post-operative pain? Yeah, um, as I already um, said, um, there are some hints. Um, for example, what we already knew from studies which have been done before is that pre-existing chronic pain and pre-existing um, use of painkillers, specifically of opioids, um, are a risk factor um, of um, development of chronic post-surgical pain. Um, we had some difficulty to identify these factors in our um, uh, um, um, recent trial. Um, and there were two interesting findings. First, the um, incidence of chronic post-surgical pain was less than expected and uh, lower than in previous trials, which might be a good um, message. Um, our explanation for this is that hopefully anesthesiologists and surgeons and also GPs and other caregivers are more aware of this issue and already use preventive strategies like using regional analgesia, for example, during surgery. And um, the other, and I think this is a really interesting finding, uh, the other interesting finding was that uh, of all four surgeries, the highest incidence of post-surgical pain was found in endometriosis surgery. And this is really new because before nobody else has looked on the long-term outcomes in terms of pain after endometriosis surgery. And this is, I think, one of the really large advantages of this whole project that we had um, these interaction with Katie with um, the TRIP subproject and so could um, uh, yeah, include endometriosis surgery in our observational trial. And this is really new and we will have a closer look on potential risk factors specifically in this uh, um, risk group or in this risk surgery, if I could call this like this. But again, it's still um, too early to um, really um, clearly say what um, is a risk factor. We are now looking on interventions done during surgery, like different types of anesthesia and analgesia, and hopefully we can tell you a little bit more in the future. Great. So we have a question from Katrina in the uh, in the on the mic. Um, do you want to speak, Katrina? I just unmute, unmuted you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't know if this question relates to this section of the discussion, but um, I'm just interested in with the longer the person is waiting for an operation, 
would that have an impact in then the chronic pain, especially since you were waiting and that um, if you were on like a, a lot of medication while you were waiting, um, is there any kind of um, studies in relation that that um, actually changes the brain's chemistry or the brain's perce perceptions of pain? Just them two kind of between the the weight of operations and also the um, the medications as well. The longer yeah. you're on them. Uh, Katrina, this is an excellent question. I really like this question. And first, um, I will um, use this as a um, uh, yeah, hint to our uh, uh, group that we try to look into our data. Um, from trauma studies, what we know, as I already said, that in former studies, um, we saw that um, the pre-existing use of analgesic and specifically of opioids are a risk factor. And here there are some studies, not all, but some studies who show the dose dependent effect. The higher the doses before surgery, the more, the higher the risk of um, chronic post-surgical pain after surgery. Um, we are not really sure if also the duration is an issue um, because it's often difficult to obtain this data because often patients have difficulties really to clearly say, I got uh, opioids for four months or for one year. So this is a little bit tricky, but I will take this as a um, very good idea uh, and we will discuss this in our group if we could try to, um, yeah, to look into our data or there are other databases um, which look on similar issues in one of these other databases and if you could answer your question. Thank you. Sorry, Great. not uh, more concrete, but this is all I can say right now. No, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Katrina. Great question. So, um, Deirdre, you have your hand raised. Do you have a comment or a question? Absolutely. I'll, I'll just respond as well to what Katrina said there in that, I mean, the last statistics I saw for a diagnosis of endometriosis can take anywhere between seven to 10 years. So I think you can't underestimate the impact that that's going to have on somebody's life, regardless of whatever kind of tr treatment they're undergoing at the time. So that must be made taken uh, into consideration too. So it's a great point. Um, I just wanted to say around patient reported outcome measures, uh, PAE, we've just been part in the Delphi process through with IMI, um, but also with the NIH in America to try and reach a, gen a general consensus on, yeah. on the four different types of pain. And hopefully is coming up to, to publication for this year. But really what we found, um, and I won't say to the specific results, but it may be something, Winifred, that the, the group should take into consideration that a, a consensus has already been reached um, both from patients, researchers and clinicians uh, through a Delphi process around what these outcome measures should be. And there were, what was surprising was that they were similar in a lot of the different types, yeah. types of pain, even though some of the, the, the um, you would think some of the questionnaires should, should be very different. Uh, actually, there was a lot of commonalities between the four different types of pain and uh, look at. So it might be something to consider before you're going into your next round. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for this uh, comment, yeah. Integrate pain. Uh, Winfried, you mentioned uh, pain self-efficacy. Uh, what does that mean on a, on a basic level for a patient? Um, that's a, um, yeah, very good question. We, um, um, when we did this first, uh, the group, the work package two, um, Esther and Tiltrud, um, the first consensus meeting we offered, different um, yeah, conceptual ideas, what are important outcomes. Self-efficacy very basically means the perceived ability to cope uh, with your pain more or less by yourself, with um, whatever you have um, mentally uh, in terms of medication, in terms of um, health. And it turned out that um, the stakeholders, uh, including the patients, um, thought that this is a very important um, um, issue which should be discussed uh, when it uh, comes to the um, yeah, relevant patient reported outcomes. There is some discussion if self-efficacy is an outcome or it is something like an um, um, independent factor which in 
inf influences outcome. I think both will be true, but certainly we have drugs, we have interventions which foster self-efficacy and we have others which um, might decrease self-efficacy. What is clear is that self-efficacy is considered to be important or a high degree of self-efficacy and that, should, that all care, um, medical care, personal care interaction between staff and patients should um, aim to increase self-efficacy. Um, you spoke as well, Winfried, about the, you mentioned uh, core outcome set. I'm wondering, What's the challenge when you're trying to conduct a clinical trial and maybe when you're trying to power the trial, you have to focus on one measure? Um, is, is one of those measures given more priority than the rest in the trial? Uh, for example, is, would pain be giving more priority than another measure when you're trying to, let's say, um, power the, the, the trial or, or um, and so forth? Or how... Um, how do you go about picking the, 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 main, the, the main measure in your trial? Um, we, uh, this is also a discussion which um, has also begun before this project. Um, um, I did not mention that we also have uh, a large part of our uh, activity in our project is to discuss with regulatory uh, authorities like EMA, um, the uh, requirements for clinical studies and be exactly um, sorry I have to be exactly um, do um, what you just um, said we discuss if it might be a good idea in some in some um, situations to offer uh, or to aim for two different outcomes yeah where um, okay. intervention or drug um, gets improvement or is considered as effective um, when it, for example, reduces um, not only pain, but perhaps in, in, in increases um, yeah, function. I, I see that sleep and fatigue, um, sleep seems to be important to a, a lot of patients. And that's something that isn't picked up on maybe in certain trials. Has that made it into the core outcome set? Yes, um, oh, yeah. okay. sleep, no, sleep so far is not considered uh, to be part of the core outcome set, um, but it is um, specifically, it, it, from my point of view, it's more important in chronic pain. Yeah? Um, what is interesting is that when we use the activity tracking device, we also can uh, measure sleep or these pattern of sleeps and um, comment or at least to roughly say something about sleep quality. And what we are do now are doing is to also analyze, analyze the sleep data. And what we are looking for, or what we are aiming for is to analyze a potential um, association between sleep disturbances in the early phase and um, yeah, chronic issues later on, like chronic pain or functional interference. So far, sleep is not really an issue in the acute pain area because people are not even asking for sleep. So, so far, it's not part of the acute pain cause of okay. okay. Thanks very much. That's great. So, before we finish, I'll just uh, reach out and ask uh, does anybody else have any last minute questions? It doesn't seem to be at the moment. So I'm just going to hand over to Rolf Dedliff and Deirdre for concluding remarks. Yeah, we hadn't pre-agreed on who should start. Should I start you wrap up in the end? Okay, good. So <clears throat> before I do that, so in acute situations, sleep deprivation can actually mimic some of the phenotype of fibromyalgia. I find this quite interesting. Um, that's something to, to follow on. It might be part of, of the mechanisms involved. So what I found interesting is on one hand, the, the patient training aspects that Pain Alliance Europe is offering and uh, the uh, IHI patient pool that the Innovative Health Initiative is offering. Uh, I think those are very good opportunities for future patient engagement. As far as we're concerned, uh, we have prepared and will continue to prepare lay summaries of some of our publications that I think are available via the IMI Pain Care website, but also the EFIC website. So two different ways you can address them. And uh, I think quite importantly, 
EFIC and Pain Lines Europe have asked the I My Pain Care participants if they would be available for future discussions, whichever the format. And most of us have said yes. So I think we can probably continue uh, to answer questions uh, later on. With this, I would like to hand over to Gitre for the final word. To say we can't. Um downplay the huge amount of work that has gone into this project so far. I mean, we've only really heard a snapshot of each of the subgroups today, but this, if you think seven years in the making and all the input that was involved, both from the patients, from even at the organizational level to even organizing the event today. So I just really want to thank seven years ago was before my time as president, but you get the great opportunity of coming along and realizing all this work has happened so far and that the, the foundation was the, the patients and the excellent relationships that are there with everybody that's on the call today between EFIC, PAE, IMI, IHI, FPA, everybody involved because we need everybody at the table. So I want to thank everyone for all the work that went in today. Thank the patient advocates for, for stepping up and showing really what patients can do when we're given the opportunity. And thank you all for your great questions today and participation. And we look forward to the next session and delivering more results within the project. Great stuff. That's brilliant. So I, I'm just going to close the webinar and I'm going to repeat a lot of what Deirdre has just said. I'd like to thank everybody for participating in today's webinar. To all the panelists, um, really interesting presentations. Uh, thanks very much for uh, taking the questions. I'd like to thank all of the attendees for your questions. Uh, sorry for uh, any uh, technical problems with Zoom. But um, I thought we had a great discussion, uh, really important topics around uh, stigmatization, uh, really important um, kind of exciting developments as well around the future uh, for chronic pain and that there's hope and optimism. Uh, we have one minute left. Uh, I want to know, does anybody else have anything to say? Any panelist, uh, Jane, anybody else, any final remarks or is that everything? Thank you for organizing this. No yeah. problem. Thank, thank you for joining and uh, thank you for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule for this webinar. Uh, we're very you. grateful. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a good Bye. evening. Bye. Bye now. Thanks.